for late model Toyota 4x4s, removing the sway bars is a hot topic. The hardcore guys will say, you might as well hang them on your wall, otherwise you ain't got no flex. While some others believe that is a stupid idea. The benefit off-road is minimal and it is not worth the risk. Or is it? After all, Kia took their Sorento, yes, that Sorento, up Hell's Gate by removing the sway bars. And that clearly did something. So in this video, I conducted some controlled testing to show exactly how much articulation you gain by removing the sway bars. And better yet, should you remove just the front, the rear, or both for the best results. And at last, I will share my personal setup and experience in daily driving. And spoiler alert, I didn't simply remove my sway bars. I did something else that's not very common. All right, let's get started. Hi, welcome to Tinker's Venture, I'm Kai. First of all, a disclaimer for this video. By no means, I recommend you remove your sway bar. Doing that will decrease vehicle stability, just like lifting your suspension or loading heavy stuff on your roof. It is not a simple binary good versus bad, but a game of trade-offs you need to play yourself. This video simply presents objective data and my personal experience. To test the effect of sway bars on articulation, I conducted a series of corner travel index tests. Just like in my previous videos, we will drive up the ramps until the diagonal wheels break traction. So there is negligible normal force under those tires. We have my friend Peter's bone stock 2012 FJ Cruiser, as well as my FJ with long travel suspension front and rear. Starting with Peter's stock FJ, as a baseline, all sway bars connected, it articulated 3.7 inches with the IFS and 10.9 with the rear solid axle. If we dissect this articulation further, the front suspension compressed 1.5 inches and drooped 2.2. It did not touch the bump stop, nor fully extend the shock absorber. So we didn't utilize the full range of suspension travel as we measured in my previous video. The rear axle had 5.3 inches compression and 5.6 of droop, but it didn't reach the bump stop either. I also conducted the same test on a stock 5th gen 4Runner and it has similar results. Now let's remove both front and rear sway bars and see what happens. Interestingly, the rear axle did exactly the same 10.9 inches. However, the IFS now has 6 inches of articulation. 0.6 came from extra compression and 1.7 came from added droop. Now we fully extended the shock. In other words, if you have extended travel coilovers but still had the front sway bar in place, you will not realize any increase in articulation. That's because the stiffness of the sway bar prevents you from even reaching the factory full droop. Without sway bars, our total articulation is now higher. But more importantly, the body of the vehicle is much more leveled. You will see why the levelness is crucial in a few moments. With both sway bars removed, this is now more on par with the KDSS equipped vehicle. Yes, that system really works. If you are interested in learning more, I included the link to my KDSS video in the description below. Now, back to Peter's FJ. We all saw the rear articulation did not change. So what will happen if we put the rear sway bar back and only leave the front one removed? I encourage you to pause the video, take a guess, and leave a comment below with your prediction. After adding the rear sway bar, would the total articulation decrease, increase, or remain the same? It will be interesting to see the distribution of all your answers. Okay, here's the result. Pause the video if you're still thinking. With the front sway bar removed, but the rear one in place, the rear axle now articulates 10.7 inches, a little bit less. However, the IFS now has 6.5. So we actually gain a little bit in total articulation by adding a sway bar. That's really counterintuitive, isn't it? The key point I want to illustrate 
is that the front and rear articulation is by no means independent of each other. They are highly interactive. Everyone wants more flex. But what most people overlooked is the balance between front and rear suspension. More specifically, the balance of suspension stiffness and maximum travel. For this topic, I was planning to use the stock FJ for visual illustration. But it turns out you can't really see the small change before and after adding the rear sway bar. So let's look at my long travel FJ, which will exaggerate the magnitude. In our first test, both front and rear sway bars were removed. Oops, I'm sorry, I have too much flex for these ramps. But that's okay, let's focus on the front to rear balance. Despite my long travel IFS having 13 inches of available travel, it only articulated 6.7 inches. That's about the same as these factory IFS. What the hell man, this suspension cost me 6 grand. In contrast, the much cheaper rear suspension was doing most of the work, articulating 17.3 inches. Due to the difference in mechanisms, the IFS would behave stiffer than the solid rear axle in articulation, even if they have similar stiffness in straight up and down travel. And yes, we are not 100% maxed out yet, but because of the front and rear imbalance, my FJ is already leaning heavily to the passenger side. Meanwhile, if we want the IFS to flex more, we really need more weight to the driver side. So even if we have a bigger ramps to climb, this weight transfer will further divide the front and rear flex. Now, after connecting the rear sway bar, the front and rear stiffness is more balanced. You can clearly see the vehicle become more leveled. So the front and rear suspension can share the work more evenly. Ideally in this situation, we want the vehicle to be perfectly balanced front to rear which we observe on the solid front axle Jeep Wrangler. An IFS 4x4 will not achieve this perfect balance due to the different modes of suspension stiffness. I went over that in my Jeep vs Toyota video, check it out through the link below, and we won't digress further. Now, I know what you're thinking. What happens if we install the front sway bar, but only remove the rear? That's like the worst possible front and rear balance. Would it actually flex less than factory? Let's bring back Peter's FJ and test it out. Compared to factory configuration, the IFS now flex a tiny bit less, but the rear gained one inch extra flex and is now touching the bump stop. Overall, the total articulation was slightly better than stock, but noticeably worse than the other two cases. Nevertheless, if we increase the rear shock length, this configuration will unrestrictedly allow more rear flex. And that is the idea of the very popular Toyota Rear Long Travel Kit. Those rear suspensions have shocks 6 inches longer than stock, so you will have some crazy looking rear flex. But even if you want to run a rear sway bar, you can't. Because with so much droop, the sway bar end links will bind way before the shocks fully extend. Without a doubt, having big rear flex is still highly valuable in most rock crawling situations. But the imbalance front to rear could get you in some tippy situation, especially if you keep the front sway bar. Behind most of those impressive rear flex photos over the internet, you'll find their IFS were basically flat. Now, you can slightly improve the balance with the Curry anti-rock rear sway bar. Because it mounts behind the axle, it resolved the end link length problem. I actually bought one way before I have this YouTube channel, but after calculating its stiffness based on geometry, I found it noticeably softer than the factory sway bar. Well, of course it is better than no sway bar at all, which is what most people compare it to. But that wasn't what I'm looking for. So what setup did I end up with? A rear sway bar stiffer than factory. By geometry, this sway bar has four times the torsional stiffness as the factory one. But of course, there is no free launch. Because this still mounts to the factory location, I'm limited by the end link length. With the longest possible end links, I was only able to run rear shocks 
that are four inches longer than stock, instead of six like those really long travel kits. And this was the setup we saw earlier in the video. With this setup, I went through the famous golden crack in Moab without lifting a tire. That was plenty good for me, so I'm settling with these shorter shocks. On the other hand, my friend Devin, aka Iconic FJ, also values front to rear balance. But he is no man of compromise, so he custom ordered a giant racing sway bar and mounted it through the frame. It works just like the anti-rock, but much stiffer. Along with his custom shock mounts and Dana 60 rear axle, he tackled the soup bowl on the Rubicon trail. Not many IFS rigs can do that. Adding a stiffer rear sway bar for off-road is definitely not a common mod, at least in the Toyota world. But I hope my and Devon's FJ present you a different perspective. A few weeks ago, I ran the poll with my subscribers. 58% of you chose removing both sway bars should yield the most flex, which is definitely the most intuitive answer at the first glance. But as you saw in earlier testing, the reality is not that simple. There are many interactions under the surface, but we often overlook them and oversimplify. If this video is helpful to you thus far, I would really appreciate if you check out my website tinkerdesign.com for products I design. As a nerdy mechanical engineer, making products is my passion, and that's how I found producing these videos. So I want to thank you for your support. So far, this video is highly focused on off-road articulation. I deliberately didn't focus on highway handling because it is highly subjective. Just like in my Jeep vs Toyota video, I mentioned that I could not stand the loose handling on the Jeep JL. Wow, this is a lot, man. How do you live with this? But tens of thousands of people are totally fine with it. It doesn't mean I'm better or worse, correct or wrong, it simply means we are all different. So don't simply ask the internet, is it okay to drive without a sway bar? You will not get a definite answer. As my other recent poll showed, it was roughly a 40-60 split among my subscriber. And you'll find polar opposite experience in the comments. So the most efficient way to find out is to test it yourself. If you don't like how it drives, just put it back. For me personally, no front sway bar plus a stiffer rear sway bar is the best compromise. The stiffer rear sway bar had a noticeable improvement on body roll. I have driven across the US many times and tackled some challenging trails. But to me, it still handled way worse than something with both sway bars. I let my wife drive the FJ off-road, but I never felt comfortable letting her drive it on the highway. Again, this is all personal preference. When I let Peter test ride my FJ, he did notice the body roll, but it wasn't bad at all for him. He even said, Would you trust your wife drive this across the country? Absolutely. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh. I, I wouldn't trust her to drive it in a parking lot, though. <laughs> Nevertheless, Peter has no interest in technical wheeling. He and his wife tow a trailer and do a lot of car camping. Peter actually wanted even more highway stability than stock. So I helped him install the same stiffer rear sway bar like mine. And of course, he still had the front one in place. He loved the new handling, especially in towing. But what I'm interested in is how this changed his articulation. Any guesses? Here's the result. We basically traded a little bit of rear flex for front flex, but the total articulation remained the same. Did you guess the result this time? I will show a mega summary of all data at the end so you can pause and review. Thank you for watching. Go check out my website and subscribe for more video just like this one.